So hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Fabio Gigi. I am the chair of the Japan Research Center here at SOAS. And as you can see, there's candlelight in the background. I've put on some incense because I thought it was very good for today's topic. Uh, and of course, it's a great pleasure to introduce um, our friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Benedetta Lomi from the University um, of Bristol. She's a lecturer in East Asian religions and has taught on Japanese and Chinese uh, takes on religion. She, is, uh, she has published widely on the material aspects um, of religion, um, a very interesting work on uh, materia medica, so medical matters in Heian period Japan. Um, and I think uh, the, of the materialities of the sacred is also that which um, is an important topic uh, for her talk today. And it really sounded from the abstract, it sounded like almost like a detective story where people try to find out what is at stake, what is the object, what actually exists and what does it represent. So her talk today uh, is called Body Like Withered Wood and Heart Like Dead Ashes, Reconfiguring the Remains of Kamatari Statue at Tonomine. So over to you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Fabio. Let me try and share the screen without. Um, sorry, you probably see portion of my. Can you all see the? Does it look okay? Looks great. fine. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you again so very much for your very kind introduction. And also, thank you to the Japan Research Center for inviting me to present on this project. Um, I am, of course, thrilled and nervous to be presenting at SOAS because it's my alma mater and I know many of the people in attendees know me. Um, and I am only sorry I cannot be there in person and see many of you in the audience. It would really have felt like being at home, although I am at home as well, so it was quite nice. Um, so as Fabio mentioned tonight, I uh, will present uh, on an aspect of material culture that has been at the center of an ongoing research that I've uh, started a few years back as I was stuck in Japan <laughs> during the first wave of the pandemic, unable to access um, uh, sources and, and, and archive, archives that I needed for another project. And so I started looking into uh, diaries um, and uh, uh, I stumbled upon a very interesting story about uh, the famous life site statue of uh, uh, Kamatari and Trine at Tonomine, um, which was lost in a fire at the beginning of the 13th century. But before I get into the details of this icon and its demise, which is really at the center of my talk, um, first, I would like to offer a few words of explanation as to how I got into this topic, aside from being in, in lockdown with only a handful of sources, given that my uh, primary research interest is indeed material culture and ritual, but mainly belonging to the Buddhist tradition and very little of what I will present on today, tap into Buddhist sources uh, to offer explanation and rationale of what's going on. And in fact, this paper is based and elaborates on a section of an article that I have now completed and that it's due to be published next year, a part of a special issue of Ars Orientalis, uh, Fabio also participated. Um, and the topic was reuse and recycling in Japanese visual and material culture. And it has been uh, uh, sort of put together and edited by Halle O'Neill. Um, and when I was first invited to take part in this project, my intention was to focus on uh, pre-modern practices linked to the refurbishment and disposals of Buddhist icons. That is, I was interested in understanding what happened to sacred uh, images, to sacred objects that had been damaged and needed renovations, or worse, that had been completely destroyed and were beyond repair, uh, given the apparent lack of precise virtual curricula targeting their temporary or permanent deactivations in pre-Tokugawa period Buddhist ritual collections. So uh, what I um, sort of, what interested me is that by the 17th century, we have uh, within Buddhist manuals, instructions on how to perform uh, what are called sending away ceremonies, uh, uh, the Hakken Shiki or the Hakken Saho that, um, 
sort of target the temporary, temporary deactivation of sacred objects. And they are generally presented uh, in connection uh, that is immediately after rituals of consecration, such as uh, the uh, Mizogi Kaji and the idol burning ceremonies. And these um, sending away rites that are also called the uh, soul extracting rites so still exist today. Um, and our performer can be performed when images has to have to undergo refurbishments uh, when are moved from their usual uh, location, maybe because displayed temporarily in a museum or as part of, of an exhibition, or in connection uh, to more permanent the consecrations of sacred items, although I, I couldn't see that being the case in Tokugawa sources. Um, when it came to the medieval context, however, we are faced with a dearth of information regarding these types of, of procedures. And this is quite puzzling for various reasons, not only because medieval ritual collections are well known uh, as the Buddhist one for providing details and instructions on an impressive breadth and typology of rites, um, but also because destructions of sacred items was not uncommon at all. Temples, wooden structures uh, made them and their context uh, particularly vulnerable to natural disasters, uh, so earthquake, thunderstorms, and floods were indeed a menace. And, and aside from these um, uh, periods of warfare, or, or period such as the one between the 11th and 16th centuries that were characterized by uh, skirmishes between, also between religious institutions, um, which led to, to, to conflict, um, also meant that uh, sacred objects uh, could become collateral damages. And so even in spite of any efforts made to preserve them, they could easily be destroyed um, or, 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 or at least damaged. So these circumstances necessarily require dealing with what remained of scriptures, of icons, paintings, and all other sacred items. So I, I, um, I, I wanted to investigate more into what happened to these type of uh, remains. And aside from conceding that possibly rituals such as the sending away ceremony or the, uh, or the soul extracting rite may have just been practices that emerged at a later stage, I remain unconvinced that either no ceremonies at all were carried out for damaged discarded objects, uh, um, um, nor that if some sort of liturgy did exist, it was simply not recorded because it was an inefficient and fortunate event and therefore sort of it was not worthy or uh, it was not interesting to record. So this was really because if um, images and statues of Buddhas and Kamis, but even portraits of eminent individuals, such as the one I'm discussing today, and even sacred objects more broadly were thought of embodying the power of the entity they represented, and their production was uh, generally uh, ritualized, why not the demise of such objects? So these were uh, the sort of uh, the concern that drove uh, my, uh, my research first. Um, as highlighted uh, by um, Fabio Rambelli, uh, however, destruction uh, is not always uh, a, a negative thing, um, especially in this modern period. Um, and he mentioned that Buddhist institutions were in fact quite successful at time in um, what, is this, what he calls the domestication of destruction, that is uh, being able to transform the loss of sacred material culture into a symbolic, um, a political or even into an economic game. And, and therefore, unsurprisingly, uh, we have sources that tend to recast the loss of major icons uh, into miraculous events, such as the case that you see on the slide eight century. Um, sorry, uh, the, uh, sort of a, a later representation of the Ishi Yamadera um, uh, um, uh, canon statue. Uh, that was destroyed uh, in a fire at the beginning, uh, what, toward the end of the 11th century, and, and that according to the Engi flew out of the blazing temple and found shelter at the top of a tree. Um, and so uh, we do have the, the type of attempt of uh, reconfiguring 
so to speak, the loss of an icon um, uh, in a way that is uh, uh, propitious uh, to the institution that lost it. Um, however, while the creation of miraculous narratives is consistent with a uh, uh, type of literature such as the one of Angie that provide foundation myths, um, I was interested in um, practical concerns uh, and, and solutions. And so um, I, I turned to diaries uh, in the, uh, and, and temple records in the hope of gaining further insight into this aspect and into the questions of those in charge of uh, uh, sanctuaries or related to specific country uh, had when a major loss of material culture uh, occurred. Um, and so it is why looking through a variety of different diaries and sources that I stumbled upon a long session of uh, the Inokuna Kambakuki, the uh, diary of uh, Konoe Iezane, um, entirely dedicated to an incident which took place at the beginning of the second month of 1208 at Tonomine. Um, so following the sudden um, attack by armed forces uh, from uh, Kimpusen, the main portrait statue of Kamatari was burned to ashes alongside several Buddhist icons. Um, the remains of all these statues were mixed together. Um, so much so that it was impossible for the monks in charge to distinguish those belonging to Kamatari statues from those belonging to Buddhist statues from rubble and dirt that had accumulated. And so not knowing what to do, um, uh, they collected all the debris um, and awaited for official instructions. So this entry, um, and I elaborate on the events uh, uh, later, is notable for several reasons. The first, uh, Iezane uh, um, writes down all the different liturgies that were carried out in the aftermath of uh, the event, um, including also all the divinatory rites with related uh, uh, questions um, that uh, were held. And this obviously shed light on the different type of ritual practices that could be held in these occasions, and there are various, but uh, these in fact turn out to be the least exciting or insightful part of the diary, <laughs> the uh, sort of a list of ceremonies uh, um, um, uh, and recitation of scriptures that we can all imagine from the Nino Kyoto, the Lotus Sutra, um, and, and a series of very lengthy divinations about the occurrence. But as the leading member of the Fujiwara and Kampaku, he had been appointed a little over a year prior, Yezane was tasked to carry out an investigation into the incident in the attempt to establish exactly who was at fault for the burning of Kamatari's statue, um, but also what the overall implications and meaning behind the accident were. Um, his diary does include transcriptions of the views of several other leading uh, Fujiwara uh, members on the statues of the sacred remains, on the proper way of handling this remain, as well as their reflection on whether uh, it was appropriate to build a new portrait statue of Kamatari or not. So in this regard, Yezane's diary offers really a unique insight into uh, uh, the practical matters that follow this loss, the sudden loss of obviously a very powerful icon, um, the concerns of uh, the people involved, both at Tonomine and at the court. And at the same time, it also sheds light on broader considerations on the nature of uh, certain icons, especially uh, icons of, of an important ancestor, and on the relationship between a sacred object and its remains once uh, sort of the sacred object, as in this case, has been uh, burned to ashes. So the um, aim of my paper today is to present these different considerations uh, and uh, reflect on what they can tell us about the ways in which sacred waste was envisioned and handled in the medieval period. And I will try to, uh, to show that um, any decision of um, what constituted the proper etiquette 
dependent upon the joint appraisal of historical precedents on the one hand and the interrogation of cosmological forces that had precipitated the damages and destruction in the first place on the other. So given the numerous variables involved in this process, my main argument here is that a religious specialist and institutions dealing with remains of sacred items uh, needed to operate on an ad hoc basis, deciding on what practice and what ritual they needed to carry out, carry out depending on a variety of different circumstances. So before we uh, proceed, um, I just wanted to give you a little breakdown of uh, my talk and uh, what I will cover. So first, I will um, give you a little bit of context by saying a few words about uh, uh, the icon in question, although I'm sure many of you will be familiar with what I'm saying already. Um, but this sort of aims at clarifying or establishing the role of the statue at the cultic center. And, and then I will offer a uh, um, brief but slightly more detailed account than what I've already presented of the incident of 1208. In the second part of the talk, I will instead focus on two issues uh, that uh, interested uh, the Fujiwara uh, circle of, of nobles that debated it. Um, and that was the part of the focus of the investigation on, on, the, on the incident. And these um, attempted um, to answer to question on the one hand, what should be done about uh, the statue? Should we rebuild it? Should we make a new one or not? And then what should we do about uh, the ashes of Kamatari's icon or the ashes that have uh, remained? Um, and um, the, the second part of uh, sort of uh, of the second part, the second question of the second part, is the one that I am still uh, working on because there is so much to go through, and so I really look forward to uh, comments on it uh, later in the Q and A, and then I will uh, offer some concluding reflections, of course. Um, so. Uh, on to the first part. So the cultic site of Tonomine, um, uh, also known today as Tanzan Shrine, um, has been traditionally linked to um, um, the Fujiwara clan, thanks to um, its enshrinement of uh, uh, the tomb and statue of, of the state of Fujiwara Kamatari. Um, we do have records of the process through which Kamatari came to be um, um, uh, enshrined at Tonomine through sources that are, however, quite late with respect to when uh, the enshrinement supposedly happened. The 12th century Tonomine uh, Riaki, as well as the later Tonomine Engi, trace the association between the site of Kamatari to his held its son, the monk uh, Joe. According to this account, Kamatari had expressed to its son the desire to be buried at Tonomine, claiming that this would be propitious for his descendants. And following uh, his death, following Kamatari's death, uh, Joy's dream again, Joy who is in China apparently at the time, had a dream in which Kamatari reminded him of his wish and further instructed him to build a sanctuary on the mountain. So Joy returns to Japan and moves the remain of the father who had been uh, um, um, placed uh, at another location, uh, according to the Yaki Aizen, uh, I Mountain in Setsu province, uh, and so it's relegated to Tonomine. And here he also erected the 13 story pagoda of the site and a worship hall in which a wooden life size portrait statue of Kamatari was placed. And so uh, this all um, is called uh, in various ways in the sources, and it's also. Uh, um, uh, changes name several times, but comes to be known as Shoryoin, uh, the whole of uh, the sacred spirits. Um, at times it's also called the Miedo, the um, all of the sacred image. Now, due to a series of discrepancies pertaining to the life of uh, uh, Kamatari Sunjoe and the location of Kamatari's burials and other, the narrative presented by the Tonomine Ryaki and the Tonomine Engi is considered more like pious legend than an historically accurate reconstruction of the sanctuary's foundation. And in fact, 
and very little um, is known about the actual establishment of the cultic site of the early sort of layer of the cultic site, the nature of the early cult of Kamatari, as well as the precise dating of the portrait statue. So it seems that um, in the ninth century, the site was under the tutelage and under the jurisdiction of Kofukuji, but this did not last. And during the 10th century, the, came, the site came to be under the influence of the Tendai school and affiliated with Shoren in Imperial Temple. And this uh, uh, period of, of, of Tendai oversight corresponded um, with the development and expansion of, of Tonomine with attested construction of buildings um, and performance of key state protecting rights. And it is also at this time that the role of Kamatari as the protector of the Fujiwara clan and uh, by extension, given the political importance of the clan, also of the state seems to augment. Uh, with the tomb and the wooden statue of Kamatari coming to play a key role in ensuring their stability and prosperity of, of, of the clan, that is. According to the Ryaki and according to other sources too, uh, since at least the late 10th century, Kamatari's will and its protective powers were believed to uh, manifest through very visible and audible signs associated with the tomb and with the statue. Um, uh, at time, uh, the tomb uh, would uh, uh, make loud rumbling sounds, often accompanied by unusual blows um, that were heard uh, coming from uh, the burial site in the mountain. At times, uh, cracks would appear on the face of the wooden statue. Um, and these were considered to be omens of possible threats to the clan. And thus they were carefully examined and reported for divinatory purposes. So for example, whenever the statue of Kamatari crack, the crack would be measured, uh, appropriate tools, information on the date, time, length, and depth of the cracks were transmitted to the court and a divination would be carried out to establish the meaning of the occurrence. Eventually, uh, the crack would be fixed and offerings of gratitudes would be sent by the court to Tonomine and other, um, and, and support in Zumbi. Um, I believe in one occasion that it was particularly difficult to, to fix the crack of the statue, but that was quite um, uh, and later on. Um, so, although there is no doubt over the uh, vigor and agency of the Fujiwara ancestors, given the numerous record of the cracking of the statue over the arch of the 11th and 12th century, comparatively less is known of the statue itself, of the material support of the ancestor. On the one hand, um, we know that the site had been for a period of time abandoned, that is, since the purported foundation of, of the site, abandoned, went through several reconfigurations in terms of uh, influence from other sacred sites, and even suffered numerous losses due to fires. And this is also prior to the event of 1208. So for example, uh, um, in the course of the 12th century, um, um, there, um, the main hall in, in which the icon uh, of Kamatari was enshrined uh, was uh, damaged by fire and reconstructed until uh, at least twice. Um, and while there, I, there is no mention of the actual destruction uh, of the icon prior to 1208, it is, this makes it quite hard to ascertain um, precisely uh, the deity. Um, furthermore, uh, and this complicates things slightly, what emerges from the diary of Iezane is that at the time of the, uh, of the incident, that is uh, in 1208, there were two, not one, life-size uh, statues of Kamatari installed in Shorio. And these are referred to as the principal uh, image and the display image. Uh, the existence of these two statues was apparently very well known among the Fujiwara nobles that Yitane dialogues with. Um, however, they claim and they admit that not much is known about the origin of this statue at all. And uh, 
at some point, some of the Fujiwara cast doubts over the efficacy of the second icon, given that its origins were unknown to them. Um, so let's look more closely at the events that resulted in the destruction of the icon. Of course, what gets destroyed is the main icon, not this, the, the standing icon. And uh, so the, the timeline that I provide, there are several different timelines that are offered by Iezane, but uh, the one um, that I will present seems to be the more accurate and it's based on a report that Tonomine provides two months after the event. So it's dated to the third day of the full month of 1208. And it's signed by the temple superintendent, by the temple supervisor, um, and by the head Ajari, uh, the Dharma master Kengu, uh, who all witnessed the facts and were actually involved in the events that unfolded. So what happens is that on the morning of the third day of the second lunar month of 1208, Tonomine is uh, attacked uh, um, abruptly um, uh, by armed troops coming from Kinkosan. Um, the temple administrator, um, together with four other people, fearing for the safety of the two forty statue of Kamatari, decided to remove them from their location in Choryoin. And apparently the display statues was temporarily hidden under a large tree just outside of the hall, while the main one, which was obviously what they were concerned about was placed inside a chest of documents and transferred first to the private worship hall of the Dharma master Tangon. However, um, it is moved another time because as the attackers continue to press their way into the mountain um, on the afternoon of the same day, it is believed that the, the quarters of the Dharma master are not safe. And so they bring the statue um, to another hall, a Buddha hall, and they hide it in a corner behind a very large Shakyamuni statue. Um, so the monastic lodgings were burned to the ground that very evening. So it the, the fact that they moved the statue seemed at first to have been a very good choice. However, on the morning of the following day, numerous buildings of the western side of the mountain, including the one in which the image was stored, were targeted and by sunset, nothing was left but debris and ashes. And with sunlight, a group of five monks together uh, with the temple administrator tried to uh, negotiate their way between the rubble to a certain that touches up the icon, hoping it could be um, salvaged, but uh, they struggled to gain access to the buildings that were still burning and decided to give up. So the following day, um, they uh, go back into the hole, they finally gain access, but they um, uh, resolve that it's impossible um, to identify. Um, the ashes of Kamatari tell them apart from the statues and they collected whatever they could, even though they couldn't identify them, they put them in a, they, they put all the ashes that they can find in a box. And uh, first they bury them in a secret location deep uh, into uh, the mountain. Um, and then as the situation starts to go back to normality nearly um, uh, two weeks after um, they uh, decided to install the ashes next to the surviving uh, standing in, uh, icon and everything is put back into uh, into short and in. Now the report concludes by asserting how difficult it had been to decide on the proper course of action during uh, the events and how all the choices that were made, even those that led to the loss of the main icon had been made with the icon, the main icon best interest at heart, even if the choices turned out to, to backfire in fact. 
Um, before this communication, however, Yedzane had received a piecemeal borderline misleading information uh, from the temple, from the daily entries that he compiles since first receiving news of the attack on the sixth day of the second month. He was initially, or it seems to have been led to believe that the main statue of Kamatari was safe. And whether this was an intentionally sort of false report or simply an unfortunate misunderstanding due to the circumstances, it's really hard to know. During and in the aftermath of the attacks, the commotion provoked by the extensive loss of objects and the burning of buildings, so, um, paired with a series of apprentices they travel meant that all communication occurred in a scattered way and with an unusual delay. So at first, um, Yedane seems to receive comforting news regarding the main icon, but he's nevertheless anxious and eager to send uh, a representative to Tonobini to investigate and come back with more details. And so he summons uh, the chief of the Yin Yang Guru, uh, Nobuhira, and it, he, he wants to establish a propitious day for travel, uh, but this seems not to be immediately possible. And, and so not being able to send anyone to Tonomine, he's just waiting for, for, for more news to arrive. And at the same time, he also wants to know what he should be doing as he waits. And it's, in fact, only at the end of the second month, uh, uh, on the 27 days, uh, uh, so nearly three weeks after the events, that he receives a private dispatch, briefly confirming that indeed the main icon had been lost. But even that was sort of stamped in terms of content. And so at this point, his, his, his annotation betray a palpable, a palpable sense of exasperation towards the way in which the matter had been handled by the monks of communion. So the superintendent, the supervisors, and three other individuals who handled physically the statues of the day of the attack were all accused of negligence and were all asked to uh, provide further justifications uh, um, uh, for their actions. Um, as they also impulsively, or so it seems, decided that uh, to first enter the ashes and then to install them back into Shoryuin next to the surviving icons, there was a real concern over the appropriateness of all these measures. And so a number of divinations were held surrounding this, uh, even in the course of the investigation. So the focus of the investigation um, that I would like to focus on is not really who was at fault uh, and, and why, uh, but um, uh, on the side of the nature and efficacy of uh, the surviving icon. So uh, should a new one uh, be created or should, or is the one that survived uh, good enough? Um, and um, also the issue of what um, uh, one should do with the ashes that have remained, uh, all things considered, considering that we they didn't know exactly what they were, but also sort of putting forward more practical consideration as well as ontological consideration onto the nature of um, the ashes. So uh, let's turn to these issues. Um, first, um, it's worth explaining that in Itzani's diary, the discussion is not organized around the question. So one question first and uh, another question second. He instead he presents the view uh, of each member of the Fujiwara um, sort of group uh, of, of scholarly statements that are discussing the issue. Uh, uh, and, and so each person present their view on each topic. And this is because in fact, it seems that all of these issues are interconnected in their view in the end. Um, however, for the purpose of the talk, it's easier if I look at the icon first and the ashes second. Now, regarding the need of commissioning a new portrait statue of Kamatari, the majority were in favor of not making a new icon. And the justification they offered were based on various considerations. Uh, first, they were sort of based on antecedents drawn from Chinese sources, Confucian sources, historical sources. 
they were based on um, a similar uh, local examples. And um, they were foregrounding issues of ritual propriety. Um, and at times also touched upon the differences in the way such as the Buddha's promise and ancestors should be treated in their view but also did not neglect um, aesthetic and material considerations uh, um, on, on the icon that had been destroyed. So they were really trying to be as thorough as possible in, in considering why reconstructing was not good. Um, so um, I will present some of the views that emerge um, um, uh, by referring to the specific individuals that held them. So um, uh, the, the Confucian scholar and imperial preceptor Fujiwara no Chikatsune, for example, draws attention to uh, matters pertaining to ritual etiquettes that apply to ancestor worship and states, uh, when it comes to the reconstruction of uh, an icon that has been destroyed by fire, the Sino-Japanese tradition um, doesn't have a standard praxis. Many believe it is perfectly appropriate not to reconstruct because this is consistent with sources on the as if present ritual on the Nyo dynasty. Isn't this why um, among the various shrines of our land, there are many in which the original body of a spirit has no feet? Furthermore, we can all agree that the fact that identical life-size statues have survived and is intact is a wonderful thing indeed. Paying respect to the statue is what matters above all else. And for this reason, I believe that in this instance, reconstruction is entirely inadvisable. So Chikatsune here refers to or refers to um, a Confucian exhortations found in the Analects, in Analects uh, 312, to sacrifice to the ancestors by acting as if they were present. But he also mentioned as a precedent for not reconstructing a destroyed image, a ritual called uh, Nyozai no Gi, literally translating the as if present ceremony. Uh, in, in the Japanese context, the, this practice existed um, and it existed uh, since um, uh, the 11th century and was utilized in cases in which uh, the Tenno died before a successor had been uh, nominated and installed. And at this time, in order to ensure continuity and uh, legitimacy, um, the death of the Tendo was not announced until after uh, the accession had been completed. And until then, the corpse of the deceased, of the deceased Tendo was treated as if it were alive. So referring to this practice as a precedent for the loss of the line could indicate that in Chikatsune's eyes, Kamatari's main uh, statue was of course, more than simply the life-size rendering of the Fujiwara of her father, it was his living body and as such, it, the, the, the burning of it was like a death. Um, on the other hand, the, the death didn't mean the end of the power, and it did not extinguish the power and, um, and, and, and therefore the ancestor could be venerated. Uh, even if an image was not present. And so he kind of uh, supports the idea that it's not necessary to have a material form for the veneration of a statue, of, of an ancestor. However, Chikatsune is not unilaterally advocating against the um, um, creation or identification of a new material form that can function as the seat of Kamatai's power. Um, and in fact, he acknowledges that the uh, presence of the identical standing icon uh, 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 somehow, and, and, and the fact that it managed to uh, survive are reason enough not to reconstruct. Uh, possibly also implying that the fact that the uh, other icon survived unstated could be seen as a sign of its, uh, of its power. He implies also that the beginning a new icon could be perceived as disrespectful and maybe potentially dangerous. So he does already attribute a degree of agency to this other statue too. Um, the, the same view was, was were echoed by another um, uh, Fujiwara member, Fujiwara Sketsane, um, who, who claimed that 
Um, he believed that remaking the statue was not propitious, especially since the other statue already existed and had escaped fire. He mentioned that the statue had been revered and worshipped for many years. And he also implies that the efficacy of uh, this icon is ongoing. So it's still efficacious. Now uh, he says, if a newly made icon containing the remain of the sacred one is created, however, we need to consider all the possible implications. In terms of appearance, um, he wonders whether there is someone who is able to reproduce this feature. Um, he also claims, uh, and here lifting from Confucian sources, that a temple, an ancestral temple, cannot have two main spirits. And he concludes by saying, now doesn't seem the time to be following what the Duke Huan Hof Chi did. So here he, uh, he, he quotes from a passage of the Book of Rites, a passage um, from a chapter called the Zen Zi Wen, which contains a series of exchanges between Confucius and um, one of his disciples, Zen Zi, on the matter of ritual propriety. So in one instance, Zen Zi asks whether it is possible for a shrine to have two ancestral tablets for the same ancestors, ancestor to which Confucius replies, in heaven there are not two sons, in a country there are not two kings, um, in the seasonal sacrifices, sorry, um, 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 and those to heaven and earth, there are not uh, two who occupy the highest place of honors. I don't know what, whether what you ask is according to the rule, but formerly the Duke Juan of Qi, going frequently toward, made fictitious tablets and took them with him on its expeditions, um, depositing them on its return to an ancestral temple. And the practice of having two ancestral tablets in a, in a temple originated from the Duke of Juan. Now here, interestingly, Sukhidzane draws a parallel between the icon and ancestral tablets, or at least uses the notion of uh, the presence of two ancestral tablets to, um, to attempt to, so to speak, to kill two birds with one stone. On the one hand, it shows that in principle, it has been said to be uh, possible to have two icons or two tablets of the same ancestor installed in a temple. However, he also argues that in general, it seems to be the rule to have just one. Um, and, and so again, he, they, they really look into these precedents and leave these quotations to, to somehow find justifications for both the way they had been acting up to the point and find a way to, to move forward. But aside from this, the Fujiwara nobles had another reason to believe the surviving icon was efficacious and, and therefore substitution was not an option. Um, on the evening of the 13th day of the four month, a little over two months after the main icon had been destroyed, the grave of Kamatari rumbled. It had already been rumbling on several occasions after the attack. And the following day at noon, so 14 day of the fourth month, um, the body of the surviving statue of the standing statue cracked, just like the old one used to do. And so the reasons behind this uh, were immediately interrogated and incidentally, the following day, so one day after the cracks of course, on the 15th day, Yezane records a big fire fueled by strong winds that afflict Tokyo leading to the destruction of several buildings. And so this leads Iezane to, to conclude that even if the main statue of Kamatari had been destroyed in the fire, the effectiveness of the surviving image is surprisingly like that of the original one having cracked immediately before a major event that disrupted the capital occurred. This allows us to better understand some of the remarks of uh, the Fujiwara nobles who claim that this uh, substitute statues would have been created 
uh, many years prior was powerful and therefore worthy of veneration. And so um, uh, Fujiwara and Agokane suggest that in fact, the ashes of, uh, of the destroyed image should be stored not next, but inside the body of the surviving one in order to argument its efficacy. Um, and, and in a way, he believes that the fact that one eye can escape is so uh, fortunate. Um, and by storing the sacred ashes inside the new delay one would probably not be proficient. It would not be possible. It's worth mentioning that not everyone agree. Not everyone was convinced uh, by his arguments. Uh, so some pointed to eminent Buddhist precedents for the creation of new images that were different, but not less powerful uh, than the original. And so they, they mention a variety such as uh, uh, Odayana Buddha, Seriyoji, et cetera. Um, but in the end, uh, they decide that uh, not um, even divination is necessary at the time. That the, the, the facts, the cracks somehow uh, speak for themselves. And so the, the, the statue is worthy uh, uh, of being used as the main icon now. Um, sorry. Part of the reason for reaching this agreement was linked to uh, the discussion pertaining to the ashes replete. So as the uh, accounts um, by Yezane made clear, since the very beginning, it had been impossible to establish whether any of the ashes retrieved from the wreckage of the whole belonged to the icon of Kamatari or not. So in doubt, um, uh, the monks at Tomoyumini had collected them, uh, stored them, temporarily interred them, and then um, um, put them uh, back in Shoyuin next to the, uh, main, the, the, the surviving icon. So the, the, on the one hand, the nature of these remains were uncertain, and many of the Fujiwara nobles feared uh, uh, that uh, the mishandling of something that was the, 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 the nature and origin of which was unclear could uh, somehow lead to, uh, to, to further calamities. But even in spite of this uncertainty, they feared that getting rid of these ashes altogether could be more, even more dangerous. So somehow no one ever suggested that throwing away the ashes or whenever this was raised, uh, everybody agree that simply throwing away these ashes in respect of their origin was just not a possibility. Um, in fact, they believed that there was somehow the possibility that even a, a single uh, sort of speck of dust or material part, no, no matter how small of the original icon, could still exist and meshed in this remain, and therefore that could not be overlooked. Um, and a variety of examples are brought um, to show that even an infinitesimal part remaining of a sacred object is still the sacred object. So uh, Tokudaiji Kinsuku brings us an example, um, the, not, nothing other than the burning of the sacred mirror uh, it occurred in, in, in 1040 in Chokyu one And on this occasion, uh, he claims that nothing was left uh, of uh, the regalia, and only after repeated efforts, a few small gilded particles uh, were identified and stored in a dedicated container. So along these lines, different others considered um, instances in which uh, small particles of a powerful object um, had remained, and they were either installed inside a new icons or or stored in a safe place and buried in the ground at an appropriate location. And so they come up with a variety of precedents that existed for these different two solutions, storing inside an icon or um, uh, interring at an appropriate location. 
Um, and um, the foreigner storing uh, the remains inside of an existing item seem to have been based on their investigation, the most common practice at the time. And so um, uh, Nagakane again observes uh, as follows. Um, um, he somehow brings about, he, he suggested storing items inside uh, different items have been um, the practice uh, in a variety of, of different uh, contexts. And so storing items inside this icon is acknowledging my spread practice across uh, the Sino-Japanese traditions. We know that cavities of statues are wielded by a diversity of materials from grains to coins to pouches, uh, dedication texts and talismans. Um, and um, very often the, the narrative that we find um, in scholarly works is one of enlivening and indeed uh, Fujiwara novels uh, discussions here suggest that. Um, uh, uh, earlier it was mentioned how storing the, the ashes inside the, the icon could enliven, enliven them. Um, and, and at the same time, um, uh, these procedures were not uh, considered to be only Buddhist, so they, 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 they believe that there is ground to, uh, to allow for this. Um, and for this reason, they say, it, it's quite impossible to, in the end, throw away anything. It's quite impossible to, to come to the conclusion that throwing away is the possibility. Um, on, once uh, they have turned to dust, the practice is to enclose them within a sacred body. Um, yet the presence of uh, uh, precedence uh, was not necessarily considered by all to be sufficient to settle the matter, especially given the reservation that some had over uh, the motives behind the destruction of the icon. Um, and so uh, some claim that in fact, uh, there are no sources or antecedents uh, that can explain uh, these practices in the context of, of ashes like this one that have no clear uh, sort of ontological status nor settled ontological status. And so he says, while it can be, it can look like a convenient thing to do, uh, it, it could, we, we also need to establish why this icon burned in the first place. We need to establish why this happened to make sure that we're not uh, installing something that can cause further harm. Um, and and in, this, in this regard, um, uh, there are different considerations that are brought forward over the nature of the icon. Uh, that I am still uh, struggling, uh, in a sense, to unpack in relation to the entire discussion. Um, so Kazane, again, um, in relation to these ideas, should we install them or not to install them? What are ashes? He asks exactly what are ashes after all? And in a way he says, uh, what we find in the sources is that ashes are just dead fire. But we also find the idea that the heart is like dead ashes. And, and this is all he says, but in such a short sentence, he actually says a lot. The first part he lifts from a um, Han Dynasty uh, dictionary, um, the Shou uh, Wenjie, in which there is a section on, on ashes that matter of factly states, uh, as a dictionary would, that ashes are simply what is left after the fire has died, nothing more, nothing less. And um, they can be touched, it says, only once the fire has extinguished and that's it, it's a dictionary. The second part, however, that the heart is like dead ashes, is a quotation that is taken um, from the Zhuangzi and that will have um, later implications in some dynasty practices for the creation of the body of a perfected uh, Taoist practitioner. So chapter 22 of the Zhuangzi um, compares 
the body, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the body and mind of a sage to um, a withered corpse or of a corpse of withered wood and the mind to simply be in dead ashes. So body like withered corpse or then body like withered wood and mind like dead ashes comes from this context of sort of the, the ideal body mind of that stage. And as I said in, in later sources, this idea that, that the body of the perfected persons entails first the, the burning down uh, or the turning, sorry, of the body into this withered log of wood, and then uh, the burning of this body into ashes in order to uh, obtain this exalted body. And so whether uh, Sukhazane wants to make a point, um, maybe the point being that after all, the, the withered wood of tamata, Kamatari turned into burned ashes, it's bound to mount to even something more powerful than what had happened before due to this process of transformation or not, I still don't know. But I'm surely intrigued um, by this attempt at examining uh, or interrogating the very ontology of the materials that, that had been left by scrutinizing a variety of different sources from more practical one uh, to more probably philosophical one and, and related to um, uh, issues of what to do, possibilities of what happens if we take the, the ashes or perfected forms of the ancestor and put them into another statue. Um, so following these and other considerations, it became apparent that unlike the issue of reconstruction um, uh, that was uh, uh, settled thanks to the power of the image that seemed to be uncontested, um, the matter of the ashes could not uh, be established beyond any reasonable doubt, if not through divination. And everybody agreed. So, on the 25th day of the four months, um, a group of seven uh, omnyoji uh, summoned uh, by um, the Office of Military Affairs carried out the divination. The question divined was very simply whether depositing the ashes of the icon inside the identical remaining statue would bring good or bad luck and whether the outcome of this action therefore was propitious or not. And after um, written appeals were also sent to um, uh, Minoru Kazuka, Huarano, and Roshita shrines, and further divinations of the binding of the homes had taken place, it was uh, established that um, installing the ashes inside of the remaining statue of Kamatari was the correct course of action. Purification rituals were carried out by Omiyoji on the preceding day. And then the, statue, the ashes were installed, but no specific rite is recorded to have taken place to mark the occasion, or at least I haven't encountered it yet. Um, and so uh, this is somehow concludes this investigation and, and this overview of, of what happened. And I'll just say a few things uh, in terms of, of conclusion to wrap up um, what I have presented. So as I said, what I was interested in establishing was uh, what happens to damaged or destroyed icons uh, to, um, um, to damaged statues and damaged paintings, um, and, um, and, and maybe even to reflect on whether um, the power of these objects to live to vanish uh, because of their exterior features have been somehow destroyed or blemished or torn apart. Um, or whether there is still a, a degree of efficacy and potency trapped in their um, um, uh, destroyed remains. And the answer uh, from the sources doesn't seem to be necessarily straightforward. Um, at the time, admonishments existed not to lend, and definitely from a variety of the scriptures, uh, sort of encouraging people not to let sacred items decay and prompting people to care and, and take care uh, of, of statues um, and, and 
what happens to the superintendent of, of Tonomini that are that's punished along other people for the lack of care is clearly a sign that uh, one should not let one sacred material culture go to waste. Um, however, um, sacred images, um, or at least what emerges from the discussions of the, of the, of the Fujiwara nobles, it seems, uh, or in sacred items, it seems can never really truly be destroyed. Um, the coming apart of these, these icons, and, and, and in a sense, Ermbendi also highlighted this in, in his research, always allow for the coming together of, of something else, uh, something that is at the same time different and identical to what the object was before. So if the speck of ashes that are left from the burning uh, statue of Kamatari um, may function as a synecdoche for the founder's power, um, its preservation and installation inside an identical statue is a telling metaphor for the authority of the statue and for the of the power of the statue and linked to the power of the clan. Given the importance that the tomb and statue of Kamatari had in guiding and sanctioning uh, the clan's political role, the loss of the main icon would constitute much more than a negative omen. So in this regard, the Fujiwara nobles that were tasked to decide what to do with this possibly mixed and partly spurious ashes ruled out entirely the possibility of discarding them and instead opted to divine whether storing them inside the surviving image was propitious or not propitious. The fact that no divination at all was held to set the matter of the ashes origins meant that there was probably not a lot of interest in asserting the possibility that nothing was left at all of the founder's statue, which would have been a much more unsettling outcome. The crux of the matter then is not that the sacred icon could not really disappear, could not really be destroyed, but rather that it was not allowed to disappear. It was not allowed to simply be destroyed. Um, this is because of the example that I have presented suggests the power the instantiate is not only that of the deity of the ancestor, but also that of the nature of individuals of the clan um, that possess them. And the two necessarily support each other uh, here uh, uh, quite clearly, the relationship is always nurtured and mature to interaction. Um, so uh, it, in a way, what uh, these overview of, of consideration suggests is that the um, Fujiwara uh, noblemen were actively involved in reconfiguring um, these remains along different lines uh, that served uh, their interests. And so they were ready to make concessions as to what was uh, considered to be plausible and what was considered um, to be allowed based on the, the fine balancing act that foregrounded for sure the importance of maintaining um, the sacred sites and um, uh, their ancestors while also making sure not to incur in, in any further uh, a sort of negative occurrence. So um, whether destructions of icons were intentional or accidental, um, um, whether uh, rituals should be performed in a specific way or not, uh, were matters that needed to be discussed given this variety of, of different sort of considerations and circumstances. Um, and this may reinforce the idea that sacred items cannot simply be considered ever as terminal commodities uh, in a context in which, even when reduced to ashes, even um, uh, where uh, these ashes are probably not the ones of the, uh, of, of the objects that, uh, um, that, that was the sacred objects, um, 
uh, the, 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 the notion of a secret icon becomes almost like a limitless receptacle that can never be truly allowed to, to disperse and disappear and is constantly caught in this process of a sort of resignification and reshuffling until uh, we just have a minuscule particle or a minuscule um, speck of dust. Um, I will probably stop here. Um, I thank you very much for listening and I welcome any questions and, and comments. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, please put your questions either in the Q&A function, which you find at the bottom right hand of the screen, or you can also uh, raise your hand and we can then unmute you. I mean, I was, I was, this is, this is really absolutely fascinating. Fascinating. I was, I was reminded of Kantorowicz's The King's Two Bodies in many ways, because the, the continuity really seems to be one of the main concerns. And together with that, the idea of what kind, I mean, there seem to be several material registers at work. On one hand, you have the resemblance. Um, and on the other hand, you have the, the matter. And uh, on one hand, you have sort of the continuity. On the other hand, you have the, you know, fun, the, the sort of the, the, the it's, it's a non-fungible token, you would say, sort of in, in modern language, right? The, the thing cannot be replaced. It cannot be added to, but actually, in, if push came to shove, uh, it can. And it was re it's it's absolutely fantastic to have access to this process of discussion where people think, okay, we don't quite know what it is. But I, I wanted to ask you about the relationship first between the um, the Honmie and the uh, I don't know how to uh, pronounce it, whether this is Omotemie or the the Hyomie. Um, and because that seems to sort of um, shape the way in which this discussion um, is uh, is held. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely. But from what I could hear, from what I could read, it, not much was known about uh, the standing image, the second image, the one that was on display, uh, probably. But it seems that they they are both called Amie. Um, they there is clearly the sense that they are installed in the same place. But as I was, especially when I read about the second one cracking immediately after the other one was lost, I also started to wonder whether it was always one statue that cracked, not two. And and but so far it was not that I I, I was so preoccupied in a sense uh, with other matters, so to speak, and this is why it's also still ongoing that I really don't know whether they, I, it's not clear to understand whether they were identical or not. My impression from the sources that I'm reading is that they were quite the same in terms of size. But then I don't know what they look like. Um, and I have, and I, and I welcome anyone who has more information about this to help me because it's true that I haven't had the time yet to look much into this, but they, there seem to be very similar. They seem to, to have the same size. They're both obviously in wood and they're both identified clearly as a Um Just one is the main one and the other is the, the, the one that is displayed or shown. The fact that they try to stay to get both out and that there is a lot going on around these two suggests to me that they're in any way considered important true one is left under a tree and the other is moved so obviously the, the, there was a sense that one was more powerful or deserving or more respect than the other but again they were also they also say they don't know where it comes from some say we can't have this as my icon because we don't know where it comes from we right. don't know who made it and we don't know who but there is a challenge brought towards the efficacy of the second, which right. is resolved once for it is the fire, hmm. apparently. So I don't know but if one, 
yeah. but but, so, but one also ends up inside the other right which which i and th there's something about that the, the containment of it which immediately uh brought to my mind the idea of interiority and the mind and, and when you brought in the the uh quote from the mind like dead ashes i mean this all okay the dead ashes you put them into the statue they become a new mind for that statue and it, and in a sense that it, it, it made uh, sense in this particular way um yeah, i thought that was extremely remain, powerful yeah. no especially because it's the although it, it so in the quotation that we have uh, in the atlantic diaries there is only the bit of the mind like that ashes had it been together it, the, the body like withered wood and the mind like the ashes, it would have been perfect because it would have looked as if the remaining st wooden statue is the body like uh, withered wood. And now we have the mind like the ashes. So in a way, we have a more powerful, perfected icon. But I, I, I also don't want to read too much into it. Maybe he was just looking through sources to, to find all quotations that included ashes and he just lifted those two. Um, but I just thought it was really suggestive of the process of transformation that in a context in which it was so paramount to show the power of the, of the icon as being still there, and efficacy still being there. Obviously, right. the quotation, the ashes are just ashes. <laughs> not just that fire. It was, it's not as powerful. But he quotes it nevertheless. Right, yes. He must have found some kind of affordance in, the, in this way of describing it. Um, so please, if you do have questions, put them into the Q&A um, uh, or raise your hand. Again, the raise your hand icon is at the bottom in the middle. Um, and we can unmute you. I'm just looking at the list here. There's uh, a lot of people who are in deep thought thinking about um, what has been um, discussed. And so we'll, we'll give them a little more time. Lucia has just raised her hand. And if I can just see it. Uh. Yes, thank you very much, Renadetta. This was fascinating. Um, yes, a lot of questions. I'm just thinking of what one can ask first, but there are a couple of comments that I wanted to make. Uh, first, I thought it was very interesting that the second statue cracked after the uh, first one disappears. Um, oh, it's destroyed. It, it looks like it's taking the shape of the original statue. Um, so sort of replacing it, um, even in its um, in its um, um, well cracked uh, uh, form, so to speak, um, would that change the state the, the, the status of these icons? Would would uh, would there be some kind of um, absorption of the first uh, um, of the characteristics of the first one and the second, so that the second becomes a proper image? Or, or something like that? I, so at least this is how it has been interpreted by some of the Fujiwara members that- That, that, is, that, is, uh, that, that at least, well, that it's, that it's I don't, I, they, they don't say that it replaces it, but it, they say that its efficacy is like the, the one of the icon that has been lost. But it's just as efficacious for their purpose, so it, it works well. I, I don't I don't recall the language of substitution, but somehow there is the acknowledgement that it, it worked that it's as efficacious as the previous one because it cracks like the previous, so it sends warning like the previous one, and it, it so happened that according to the records, the, the warning was about something that actually happened immediately. Uh. And, and so I, I don't know whether there, there is a sense that it, well, of course it's, it, it is a, a substituted body uh, of, we can interpret it as a substituted body. I'm um, not a body, I was thinking really a substitution of, uh, 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 of the icon itself. 
So it's, you say that they don't really speak about substitution, but the the physicality, perhaps we can say, of the of the statue seems yeah. to be um, speaking for it. Absolutely, and and that's why I was also curious to. It would be very interesting to to know whether this happened before, whether the or whether the the the, the display one cracked before, or whether this was a prerogative of the main one that that all of a sudden, as, as if a sort of a, a transfer had occurred, becomes, as you're saying, the, the, the surviving one morphs into the existing one. Mm. It's really, um, it's really fascinating. And uh, uh, yeah, of course, one can only um, sort of uh, guess what what possible interpretation can be given there um but i, I also have another question the the um, the statue this this specific statue is clearly connected to a um a specific person so you have um, rightly interpreted within a question of ancestor uh, ancestorship and uh, and um uh, lineages and also um Sort of human uh, aspects. So th th there were some of the quotes uh, uh, from the from the diaries that you're giving that that really were uh, um, suggesting that they were thinking this way because uh, after all it was the effigies of a real person. I yeah. wondered all the time whether um, what happened to um, statues of of Buddhist deities, for instance, of uh, um, yeah non semi humane. Uh, um, beings and whether the same kind of concerns, I mean, whether there would be, yeah, how, how could we translate um, these concerns um, on a broader, uh, on the broader context of the destruction, the continuous destruction of stages that did happen um, in temples in Japan? So on the one hand, what they, so I was really focusing on this one example and I'm very much aware that this is the statue of an ancestor. Um, and and they, they seem to be aware too that there are different things that could be done, but they tap in, they, they show an array of different precedents. And some of these precedents are Buddhist precedents. So they are drawn from Buddhist statues. So they do say, in the case of a Buddhist icon, this is what you do. And, and in fact, they use a, as a, sort of a example to support and give authority to the installment of the remains inside of, mm. of the existing statue. The fact that this is what you do for Buddhas, and some even even say, well, uh, in, in, this, this is really, it seems to be that in Japan, this is what we do. And, and here are all the Buddhist examples. Interestingly, they also, um, I'm really sorry, I have a starving cat. That is <laughs> 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 just sending me a whole full time and it's throwing a restoring a tantrum. Um, but they also use this example to claim that reconstruction, in fact, uh, is not a bad thing. So they seem to be to to to, to draw a line when it comes to, to reconstruction, saying in the, we have examples of Buddhist images that are made at new. Uh, once one has been destroyed and that are just as efficacious and they are just as powerful. And, and therefore it, it, it is possible to, to build a statue anew. It so happened that here, I don't know whether it is simply because um, the statue of Kamatari, the, the remaining statue of Kamatari ends up being quite, sorry, a powerful, um, but then that they, don't, that they don't rebuild or because it's a statue of an ancestor. This is unclear to me, but it, they, they have this, what I take away from the discussion, as I was saying, is that there is no, they, they acknowledge that there are, there are no standardized way of acting in this respect. But, and so they, they show that there are so many possibilities out there based on precedence, based on what people do. There is just not one way, just as there is just not one way of 
making sense of what ashes are, there is just not one way of understanding what an icon is and what you should do when it burns. And, and, and as I was reading this, I had, I, this is where I had the idea that how do you come up with a standardized ritual for something that <laughs> there is no consensus over? How do you come up with a basic praxis that someone can follow in the immediate aftermath of a destruction when there's not even a consensus as to the nature? of the very thing that has been disrupted. And so here is where the sort of contextual investigations take, need to take place. So it, it is to me still not immediately apparent whether they are believed or that from these sources we can see that there is a distinction that we would find in other type of sources probably. But at the level of these type of exchanges and these type of circles, I'm not sure that it's immediately evident that they're different. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucia. Sorry. Okay, we have we have, uh, we have two more questions in the Q and A, and I'll read out the first one. Um, oh, how does this relate to the cases in which stand-in images also become hibutsu as they are considered too powerful? You may have mentioned it already, but are there other cases of ancestor icons in Japan with two sculptures and or a similar story? Sorry, I'll just read. I'll just read it also myself. Uh, I just found where <laughs> where it is. I don't know honestly whether there are other cases um, that are similar to this one. I would certainly love to know if there are other cases in which uh, two icons existed and uh, we have a similar story. Um, and I think it does relate to, it does relate to cases in which standing images also uh, can be considered to be powerful. Here we, we seem to have a case of, of an image that remains and stand up to the occasion. And so it, it, it actually, I mean, we do have records of the cracking of this image went into the 16th century, of, of a Kamatari image well into the 16th century. So um, it, it, this function, this worked. And so whether we can wonder whether it is accidental that it has been destroyed, uh, or, or not, whether this was in fact what was supposed to happen, that this indeed was a was an icon, so it was a powerful icon. So I, I think it can certainly relate to cases. In, in, after all, what gives, or in my understanding, what gives power to these icons is, is, is their use and their veneration. So this, um, and this is clear from what they write. They, they do say that we, you, you can disrespect something that has been venerated for such a long time, um, that its existence and its presence uh, obviously allowed this icon to accrue power. It so happened that this power now is greater than what once thought. And so um, you, you can haphazardly build something new when you have something that is there that has been able to accrue all this power and has shown its efficacy, it, it would be calamitous. So I do think it relates, and I, but I don't know whether they're similar and I'd love to know. Thank you. Okay. I mean, it, it seems to me that there, there are two different ideas um, of power involved that you mentioned, uh, or, or two ideas of the sacred. And one is the, the, the idea of the sacred as a fractal thing that within the most infinitesimal small piece or piece of dust or ashes, there still is somehow the whole presence is somehow there. Uh, but what you just mentioned now is sort of more an idea that, that efficacy accrues over time. And it sort of is something that, that accumulates and that, that so, so the, the statue at different points in his life cycle is has different uh, kinds of efficacy. I think that's that's really quite interesting because in many ideas of the sacred, it's exactly these two 
registers that sort of bump into each other. And it's not quite clear um, to anyone, I think, and this is what they are trying to figure out, um, which idea to follow, right? Is, 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 every, is it in the little small thing um, or is it something that um, accumulates over time? Just as a, as a, as a, as a comment. When I, so it, it feels in the I, I it feels like they are discussing this and they are trying to work their way around these different possibilities uh, without excluding that the two can actually coexist. Um, so I would say that it, the, the type of paradigm that they present, which are aimed at really covering all the bases to make sure that they, they act in a way that doesn't backfire in any way, seem to attribute efficacy to something that has, um, some, that somehow is older and long-standing and that therefore is deserving uh, of something, that something that it's already in place, that it's already part of a precise configuration but that they have then reconfigure according to a, a variety of other ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's why the, I, the, the term reconfiguration came to mind to me a lot as I was reading this, because they, they, they were trying to relocate not only the ashes, but also the existing statue. Mm -hmm. And, and it, in my impression, for them, both paradigm coexisted. A paradigm of power that is accrued through time and through practice, um, and a paradigm in which, however, once uh, and once the, the statue has its, its statues, um, its power and its efficacy, um, you can't just think that the power withers away. It it gets to the point where even a, a small particle of it is still worthy. Mm. Uh, so, so this is what I gather from, from their conclusions. And of course, divination seems to drive everything. Mm. Um, it, it, I, I believe they don't divine whether it's worth reconstructing or not simply because of the occurrence yeah. or, or, yeah. Thank you. So there's, there's two more questions um, in the chat. Uh, I just read it for our, I think most of the participants cannot see it unless we've typed the thing. Um, doesn't this happen during the, pre I think that the question popped up during the discussion with uh, Lucia. Uh, doesn't this happen during the process of reconstruction of Kofukuji and the other Nara temples? Are these mentioned in the diaries in relationship with the reconstruction of the icon? Um, I don't remember all the examples. Uh, that they raise, but because they do bring a lot of examples of statues uh, that have, I, I believe that doesn't this happen during the process of reconstruction is um, the question of the rebuilding of the icon, right? Um, they, they, they do bring a lot of examples. Um, I, I, I mentioned the Serio Jupiter because that's the, uh, somehow the uh, famous one that they bring about, uh, but they mention several and they mention a variety of different um, um, Buddhist such as um, uh, um, objects uh, that represent kami, but also statues of specific kami. So they, 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 they try to show that it's possible across the board to, to reconstruct, but I don't remember if they bring out Kukuji and other Nara temples. I believe they do bring uh, examples of several temples and shrines when it comes to reconstruction. Okay, and there's one last question. Is the term shari ever used to refer to the sculpture's ashes? No, no, <laughs> not to my, to my recollection, no, and I, and I look for it, no. Okay, that <laughs> that was uh, yes, uh, very short and concise. Uh, thank you. Um, I I did I did remember actually looking for for it, but 
there, there is no such idea. I think many people were reminded of that Zen anecdote about the monk who, in order not to freeze to death, burns the statue, and that draws uh, cries of shock from the others. Um, and he says, "Yeah, well, are they shy there?" But of course, that is a very different tradition, um, also very iconoclastic. So, but after okay, all, ashes are just burned fire. <laughs> yes, yeah, they're still yes. the fire. <laughs> Just is the matter of fact sort of element um, to it. Yes. So thank you very much. We've come to the end of our time. Uh, it is uh, six thirty. Thank you very much um, for a really enlightening talk. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, and we have we had guests from all the way from from uh, I think furthest away was a representative from the Club de Cultura Nipónica do Colegio Militar do Rio de Janeiro, so, so from uh, Rio uh, in Brazil. Thank you very much for joining. Um, I just wanted to say at the very end, I want to draw your attention to our next event, which happens in two weeks from now on the 17th of November. Please put it into your uh, diary. Uh, Dr. Aya Home from the University of Manchester will talk about family planning in post-World War II Japan through a transnational lens. So thank you very much. There's lots of messages in the chat. Um, I hope uh, you were inspired uh, to think about sacred materials in new and interesting ways. And so thank you very much, uh, Benedetta. And uh, thank, you. thank you very much for coming and goodbye. Thank you, everyone.